Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Cooking with Clams. I'm here with my friend Vinny. Hello. We're actually on the ferry. We were on Long Island. We're headed up to Connecticut. We're going to Fisher's Island to go to Noank. Is it Noank or No Hong? We're going to Fisher's Island. Not no. We can go there too. <laughs> That's in Connecticut. Fisher's Island, New York. Fisher's Island is New York? Technically, yeah. Well, we're going to Connecticut to come back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm learning as I go. <laughs> anyway, we're going to an oyster farm. Why not? We're going to two oyster farms. But uh, we're going to get over to Connecticut. They're going to pick us up in the boat and then bring us to the oyster farm, show us a little bit of how operations work during the winter, and hopefully we get to bring some oysters back and uh, make something nice. So I have here Steve Malinowski. He's the owner of uh, Fisher's Island here. As James put it earlier, he's the godfather of shellfish in New York. <laughs> That's very complimentary. <laughs> so we're here, and you were just telling us this is the final grow out of the oyster farm. So explain. Yeah, this is this is where the oysters spend their second and final year. And um, if you look in the water, you can see that we use lantern nets. And every two buoys, we hang a lantern net, and those lantern nets have five tiers in them, and every tier we put a hundred oysters. And the oysters will come out here in the first part of May, and then in September we start harvesting them, and we harvest them until they're gone, which is generally in about May. This is where we process everything, and then under the dock here, these plywoods come up, and we have nursery systems in the summer that run down here. Now for the winter, how much does your business change? It's my busiest time of the year because that's when we're running the hatchery. We run the hatchery okay. from January until about June or July. And we start, it's the busiest time for us getting oysters out to restaurants. Okay. So we start that mid-September, you know, that peaks in December, stays it, goes to heck in January, first part of January, then, you know, it stays pretty good February and March. This is kind of interesting. We had a uh, set of, big set, these are bryozoans, and they have a calcareous exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. We air dry everything to take care of the fouling, and normally after we air dry the nets, they're, they look brand new. There's nothing on them. But these things, after they died, they leave their skeletons and they're with us the whole season. That happened during June. And those were dried four times. I think I told you that. You see them all swimming around. Mm -hmm. they're, they're about 250 microns now. There's seven and a half million in each of these tanks. Seven and a half million oysters. Larvae. Larvae. Oyster okay. larvae. And these will start, we'll have some of them that will start setting over the weekend. But they spend two to three weeks in these tanks, and then they go into this system that they set up out here. Then they'll go into this system. We put little tiny bits of shell in here that are the same size as those larvae and hope that one larvae sets on one bit of shell so that we end up with single oysters. Mm -hmm. First part of December, and they take, take about two to three weeks to be tricked into thinking it's July and it's time, it's that time of the year for them to spawn. We're taking them out of hibernation, raise the water temperature, feed them a lot of food, they think it's the summertime, their gonads develop, and, um, and then we spawn them. So this is all the food, right? everything around the perimeter here, this is the food that we, we feed. Right now we're feeding the brood stock, but eventually, by the end of February, all these tanks will be full. Everything goes well. All these tanks will be filled with tiny little oysters. And we try to produce 40 to 50 million of them a year. And um, this system will all be full by then. And this is another system that runs continuously. And the uh, as the food is produced, 
and overflows into here, and then it's pumped into that other room, or into this, mm -hmm. and then it's pumped individually to all these tanks when they have seed in them. We find it harder to grow the food than to grow the lark. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and what are you doing? Just repairing nets? Yep, we're just do this during the winter because um, the oysters usually rip through. Mm -hmm. So we just have to patch them up so we're able to use them again in the spring. So labor and time intensive. Yes. <laughs> and why you, why you have your Walkman or are you watching movies? I'm just watching a movie. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now where are we headed to? So now we're headed to the salt pond. Salt pond, and what is which there? Which is about a mile and a half from our main site. And it's a place where we grow seed for a year before we either sell it or stock our grow out system. tides and storms huh. and then big slugs of salt water come in and you know it seems totally arbitrary but the salinity has been incredibly constant it's low enough so that we don't have disease organisms in here so I started right after or during one of the hurricanes so right after uh, I don't know if it was Sandy um, you know the, we were catching blue crabs out on the lines out here that happens yeah. like every 10 years or so. Yeah. There's this big pulse of blue crabs all the way from the Chesapeake up to the Cape. And when that, when that happens, they're everywhere. Yeah. When we get to July, all we're doing is air drying. We're, every day we're putting a line of these on a clothesline that we have set up on the beach and pulling 200 nets in from the harbor. Now, what are those used for? These are for smaller seed. Smaller seed. So the same half inch seed that we sell, we stock into these nets. We put 250 in each of these nets, which ends up creating four different size classes. Then they get put back in nets at really high densities, inventory densities for the winter. And then in the springtime, we, we sell them. We call these larges. The extra larges we sell, they're size bigger. Keep it exactly how authentic it is, you know? <laughs> All right, so everyone is just repairing nets. Yeah. yeah Thousands of nets. Yeah. 1,700. What number are you on? <laughs> Five. <laughs> on number six. I think we're yeah. past 600. Yeah. We're very close. Yeah. Almost. That is wild. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So Steve's been doing this 40 years. 40 years. Long time. And he was one of the first to sell to restaurants and make the oyster a designer product that you all now have to pay way too much money for. Because <laughs> you're paying your farmers right. And your yeah. distributors. No, when you see how much work goes in here, yeah. it's crazy. This is crazy. Out on that beach, we have a clothesline system that has the capacity of hanging up one line. You have about 450 hangs on each of these lines during the growing season. And we've got a clothesline system out there that will handle one line at a time. Hold on, before you start, this is James. James Hi. is one of the best shuckers. It's one competition. But, <laughs> but he used to work with us in New York. Now he's uh, up in Connecticut. And uh, he will do this expertly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here's the important thing twist. Or you're going to break the knife. Yeah, actually, so I. Um, I'm getting out as well. The oyster is going to stick to the shell naturally. Push up a little bit now. Break the seal. Yeah, separate. Really, a lot of the merch that she's making now. But also, 
so I'm, since I'm I have like such a so two shells, one muscle. Right. We enter through the ligament here. We separate the shells by basically breaking the ligament. Cut the top muscle. And now? And the meat hasn't been disturbed. That's important. That it's is. a raw food. Texture is important. I learned that from Tina. Uh, so same muscle, disconnected from the bottom shell. There you have it. Going to be, um, you know, that one's shredded. you always make. It's more. Hey, it's more of a reflection <laughs> on the oysters themselves. I don't think and so. How low the standard of presenting them has become. Oh. It's a raw food. The texture is important. <laughs> We've determined that they really taste better. Um, with good presentation, yeah, yeah. it really affects the taste. Yeah, absolutely, because yeah. if you, you know, if you give it to a penguin and have the penguin chew it up for you, and then, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's not the same. So yeah, it looks pretty strong. Yeah. yeah. I, get the... I was go I was gonna cheers you, but okay. <laughs> hey, you know when when people bust their bellies, and you don't you're not able to to get that experience of chewing it, it's like. It, Kind of defeats the purpose when it's all scrambled up. I agree. James is a little. Those are so good. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Do you have Ice cold. I feel bad for anyone that doesn't like oysters. I know. Right? <laughs> I really like. I uh, do we have one over there? Oh no, thank you. <laughs> she almost tried one in Baltimore. <laughs> So a huge, huge thank you to uh, Steve and Sarah. Uh, Steve, thank you for taking me around the farm. That was absolutely amazing. I've never actually seen a production like that before. And uh, later on in the house, we had a bunch of raw oysters with uh, Steve's wife, Sarah, and business partner. Um, so today, I am gonna make barbecue grilled oysters. Um, I got my barbecue going over here, and uh, I, we got a little bit of snow happening right now and it's supposed to get heavier, but the heart wants what the heart wants. So first things first, we're gonna get our barbecue sauce going. All right, I'm gonna attempt to do this with one hand and the other hand holding the camera, but we've got ketchup. All right, Worcestershire. A little bit of apple cider vinegar. Some brown sugar. But now what I've got is uh, it's smoked sea salt. It's cherry wood smoked sea salt. So add that. You could use garlic salt also, that'd be great. And then just a good amount of cracked black pepper. And now we're gonna give that a stir. And we're gonna let that come up to a simmer just to thicken it up and kind of cook it down just a little bit. I don't know if you can tell, but now the snow is actually coming down. So lucky for me, these are gonna cook really fast. But uh, now I'm gonna show you how to shuck an oyster. All right, that is up to a simmer, so we are going to take that off and that smells delicious. All right, so first thing, the ligaments back here, you wanna take your knife and put it into the ligament in the back here. Now, you could shuck them in your hand like this, but if you slip, you might put the knife into your hand. So what I like to do is put them in a towel. This way, if I miss, it goes into the towel. But all you're doing is breaking that ligament back there getting the knife in like that and now very important thing you're not prying the oyster open what you're doing is turning this handle almost like it were a screwdriver so I'll show you exactly what I mean so now all I'm gonna do is turn and now it's open so now 
take my knife, slide it along the top, and I'm cutting that inductor muscle, which is down on the end there. Now I have my oyster separated. Now, of course, it's not as pretty as James's, but he's a professional. And now you take your knife, go underneath, and cut the muscle underneath. And there you go. You have your oyster separated. Now I'm going to shuck the rest of these, and then we'll get them on the grill. Now we're going to put them on the grill and then just a little like half a teaspoon of our barbecue sauce on each one, cover up the grill, and then in about three, four minutes, we're going to have our grilled barbecue with oysters. Okay, it's been about three minutes, and check these guys out. Now that's why I only put like a little drip of the barbecue sauce. I don't want to cover up the taste of the oysters. And another thing that I did was after I shucked them, I was really careful to keep them horizontal so that they kept most of the liquor, which is the liquid inside, so that they're kind of steamed in that liquor. Um, because the barbecue sauce is going to mix with that and just create a complete flavor bomb. So let me get these off and then uh, we'll move into the kitchen and eat them. You know what? I can't even wait. I'm just going to eat them out here. So they, they smell amazing. It smells like ocean water and that smokiness from the barbecue and that barbecue sauce smells so, so good. So let's go in. Cheers. Mm. Man, that is good. So the same idea as cocktail sauce on a raw oyster. That's why I just put that little drip of the barbecue sauce on this one. And we didn't cook them until there was nothing left. You know, they're not even really hot. They just steamed and kind of condensed a little bit. And what it did was actually condense that flavor so it holds up against that barbecue sauce. And I know some people probably cringe, like why would you ever cook an oyster so perfect as a Fisher's Island oyster? But I wanna show how versatile it is that, yes, and they are delicate and delicious raw. This is just as good, just as good. All right, guys, big thank you to Steve. Big thank you to James for setting everything up. Big thank you to Sarah over there at Fisher's Island. Uh, the oyster farm absolutely amazing day thank you so much for having us thank you for the oysters and uh if you like this episode hit like hit subscribe and we'll see you on the next one